So hi everybody, um, the name's Frank, Frank Fullion. Um, basically, for those of you who can't see, uh, uh, I am a silver surfer, tech geek from the 70s, um, and I'm the founder of Mubi Limited, which is uh, mobile out of home and beacons. It's a pre-revenue UK tech startup um, in proximity and location-based marketing. I'm also a roaming tech support um, volunteer for RNRB and DeafBlind UK. Personally, I don't have any current, uh, current uh, disabilities other than my sight starting to go um, in my mid-40s here, well, nearly end 40s. Um, but throughout life, I, I've got a, a cousin who's got cerebral palsy, and I've got one of my best friends is profoundly deaf, uh, and a number of acquaintances along the way with varying degrees of disability. So uh, just, just say thanks to Alistair and the team for inviting me up here tonight to um, talk to you about this. And uh, what an opportunity to share the stage with uh, Microsoft and Hector. Um, the, my experience so far is in the offline rather than the web-based. And my, my target audience so far has been um, people with hearing and sight loss. So just to get a little bit of an idea about the audience, if you don't mind, I'd just like to, there is a relevance behind this. Um, can I just... <coughs> copy Alistair's example here of raising your hands. Um, is there anybody here in the audience that hasn't yet adopted the smartphone? Okay, great. There have been before. So who's left-handed? So quite a, f not so many, about five or six. Right, that leaves the rest to right-handed. <laughs> who's Apple? Who uses Apple? Well, that's most of the room, okay, which is quite unusual. Uh, the rest Android. Who uses Google Maps? Is that over Apple Maps? Okay, so we can see yeah, that Google Maps favors in that case. Uh, who in the room's got a wearable device? So not that many, about a third of the room. There we go. People that pay, uh, people that make payments, um, who uses a card, contactless versus cash? Most of you, great. With that contactless uh, payment, who uses a phone over the card? So only about 10 of you. That's not that many. OK, so we're coming down here. Who's fortunate enough to have uh, experienced some smart home devices? So there's about four, four, four or five of you. OK, so the reason for this little test here is basically to say is that the, the topic tonight is assistive technology. And by definition, this is as diverse as the word disability. There's no one size that fits all. We all do things differently. The consumer market has uh, just gone to this here. Assistive technology, for um, just to sort of describe it in a little bit more detail, it promotes greater independence by enabling people to perform tasks that they would formerly that they were formerly unable to accomplish by providing enhancements to or changing methods of interacting with technology. So the consumer market is currently awash with products. Um, most of these products are targeted towards the mass market as a novelty purpose, um, rather than something that would be um, have a distinct value to them in their everyday lives. With, with that in mind, and my experience of um, having disability in my family and friends that I've uh, had throughout life, I've identified that using this technology, um, I've, I've, I've identified a few innovative key um, use cases, and dare I say unique, um, of how this technology can be used to transform people's lives um, on a daily basis. The problem we have here is really the, um, the adoption uh, of technology between the demographic, or the demographic population. So I'd say that baby boomers and, and, and older, um, they don't like change, generally don't like change. Generation X, that's myself and people born in the 60s, we'll look at it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll move on. Millennials, definitely keen. They are all up there for um, technology. but. With millennials, it's kind of, you have to give them something of value for them to adopt it. Generation Y and Generation Z, that's basically your teenagers and 
people born late 90s, early 2000s, they're growing up with this technology. We, we didn't have this um, when we grew up. So they're growing up with it and it will become part of their everyday life. So just a few examples of what assistive technology basically can be. So we're looking at the mobile phone, the tablet, the app, PC, apps, wearables, screen readers, internet of things, speech to text, a plethora of, of, of products, induction loop uh, for people with hearing aids, what makes these assistive technologies work? Again, you've got a combination of near-field communication, that's the contactless technology. You've got Bluetooth beacons, Wi-Fi, three or four G. If this, then that, virtual reality, augmented reality, even 3D printing. So again, you've got another mix, no one size fits all. Within our community of the hearing and sight loss, some people with hearing loss have a hearing aid. Some people have cochlear implants. Some people don't have anything. Those with sight loss, some people have a guide dog. Some people have a, have, a, have a cane. Some people don't have anything. Again, we have a difference. There's no one size fits all. There's one product that we all have, everybody in this room has, in common. And that's the smartphone. Using the smartphone allows us to do all sorts of things and opens up a, a vast amount of opportunities. It's understanding what can it, what can a smartphone do for us. So I'm on a personal mission um, to, pro to, to, to provide a gateway of inclusion and accessibility um, in, the, in the physical world, empowering individuals to live an independent life um, with using the available tech. Earlier this year, I went to the um, first ever Global Disability Innovation Summit um, held in London, and which was eye-opening to say the least. One of the key takeaways for me there was that the CEO um, from Leonard Cheshire Homes, Neil Heslop, he lost his sight about 30 years ago. And uh, he, he, he made reference to the fact that the iPhone has transformed his life. Now, to many of us, it's a novelty, it's a gadget, it's a nice to have. For him, it's transformed his life. You know, you can't ask for more than that. After that, I was uh, fortunate enough to have a blind date at an Usher Syndrome accessibility workshop. Usher Syndrome is uh, people that, have, that are deaf-blind. Um, this workshop was hosted by a, a young lady who's about 23, 24, and her name is Molly Watt. She's amazing and so talented, and even through her expressions of use of technology has afforded her invitations to the likes of Apple, LinkedIn, and various other um, head offices to go and talk and explain to them how she's able to use this technology. Again, at her age group, she's growing up with this. She grew up with Apple, and she learned about all the accessibility features that were possible. Um, so it's part of her everyday life. So at this point, it's worth highlighting the fact that although, again, there's another difference here, is uh, when we are developing for accessibility, one has to think about the various different menu options across the various different operating services. Again, not everybody has the same device. Um, users don't always know what is available for a start, and then we all navigate through our phones differently. Disability, when it comes to disability, the first thing that comes to mind is wheels. But you know, I don't mean this in a derogatory manner at all, but I'd just like to highlight here that, that wheels versus hidden disabilities. At the moment in the, in the UK, there's about 1.2 million people registered that use wheelchairs, okay? Uh, I don't believe that figure includes people that use um, motability scooters. We have just on 2 million people that are visually impaired registered. We have 11 million people that are registered as uh, hearing loss. So you can just see from those figures the differences. Yet in 2010, as part of the um, Equalities Act, building regulations um, in, in, in instilled that, you know, buildings had to become compliant and accessible for wheelchairs. What about people with, dis with hidden disabilities? According to the World Health Organization, over a billion people in the world are um, experience some form of disability. 
And uh, most, of, most of these people are affected by overcoming daily challenges in their lives, which, leads, which can lead to um, fewer economic opportunities, um, higher rates of poverty, more than the disability itself. So I don't know how, if anybody in the, in the room here has seen programs on the television lately. There's one program by the B BBC called Big Life Fix, where uh, a young chap, a, a, a child, um, he was blind and he couldn't enjoy the playground with his friends, so he felt isolated and he used to sit by himself. But people came in and they adapted the playground that would suit him, and he was then able to interact with his friends. Employable Me has been really powerful on the television, showing how people get into employment and have struggled. Not only, people, not only them, but they don't, they're sitting there thinking that it's their disability that's holding them back. It's not their disability that's holding them back. We all face these problems. Certainly if you're trying to break into the um, corporate world, you can't, you know, unless you've got a friend in high places, you don't just get an interview. It's hard work getting an interview. Um, I recently read an article about a, a chap who's a blind architect. He lost his sight in 2009, having been an architect through life. But he then decided that actually, uh, he, through his sensory um, uh, capabilities, he was able to actually come up with better architecture. Um, and he set up a architect service for specifically for blind people. So now, more than ever before, uh, the need to deliver inclusive and accessible digital products and services is constitutes both a moral and a commercial obligation. Coming into the smart city uh, side of things, um, what I'm trying to do here is, I'm trying, the problem I'm trying to solve and overcome uh, is, is daily challenges that people with hearing and sight loss experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So by installing a smart beacon in society, um, predominantly or aiming directly at people with hearing loss to start, with, start off with, allows me to then use that same network to help people with visual disabilities um, to help them navigate um, their surroundings. For example, walking into Starbucks and ordering a coffee, we take it for granted. We walk in and say, what do we want? A latte or a cappuccino or a mocha? For somebody who's visually impaired or a deaf person, it's too much. There's the barrier there is too much conversation. I can't be asked with, do you want a large, medium, small, so forth. McDonald's, just ordering a burger. What size chips? Do you want chips? Do you want a sauce? Etc. Etc. You can't be dealing with that. Restaurants, doctors, sitting in A&E as a deaf person. If your name's called, you miss it. You don't hear that. Uh, those sort of things go miss. They go past us. Uh, so basically, uh, that creates a, a, a sort of like a daunting and intimidating um, life experience and can lead to feelings of isolation and exclusion. More pressing is um, situations of chaos or panic. We've recently had a couple of terror attacks in London, Manchester, right? If, a di if, if somebody who's got a visual impediment or, um, is in the tube and there's an emergency evacuation, well, who's gonna help them? In the normal light of day, often people with, uh, with um, sight loss get overlooked. I've seen it, I've witnessed it day in and day out. Um, people with a hearing loss, if there was no, uh, an emergency situation right now where this building was uh, needed to be evacuated, we'd hear a fire alarm. That goes amiss to people with a hearing loss. They'd just see chaos and panic, wouldn't know what's going on. So this is where um, assistive technology in the public environment is really, really, really important. A very good example that I'd like to show you is um, Button by, ne by uh, Neatbox. So Neatbox is a company up in Scotland. Um, Gavin is the CEO. Gavin Neat, he's in the audience. Raise your hand, Gavin. Thank you very much. Gavin's been a um, guide dog trainer and worked with uh, visually impaired people for over 20 years. So through a real life situation, and he's experienced what people um, have problems with, the, the, the issue is you need to solve a problem. Rather than find a problem to solve, you need to solve a problem. So he's developed a situation called uh, a button. That's just something that's running in Scotland, and he's brought it with him tonight, so anybody that wants to have a play with it, please feel free to grab him after the talk. Um, but that, again, that's just a really simple situation that uh, somebody with a visual impediment or in a wheelchair 
is stuck with in a real everyday situation. I've been uh, guarding people that, um, with their dogs and, you know, it's one thing getting to a pedestrian crossing. Um, the guide dog knows about the pedestrian crossing, but the guide dog cannot understand if there's a car coming. And if it's coming, is it coming from the left or the right? So when is it safe to cross? It's take your life in your own hands. You really are trusting the public to slow down or stop. A lot of people have been hit by cars, believe it or not. Unfortunately, somebody who's blind cannot identify the culprit. So what do you do? One of those things, not pleasant. The Mubi solution, what I'm hoping to do with the, with the um, smart beacon is really create a lifestyle and community app that will be ubiquitous and work across society for people with, um, with impediments or not. My first port of call is um, hearing loss. Second, or collaboratively, um, those with sight loss. A DMP will help us with using machine learning, AI, cognitive algorithms, um, and a cloud platform that can, that can help contextually optimize the user experience um, and most importantly, ensure that it's interoperable across the various different devices. To do this, you need a smart beacon network across uh, society, put it that way, you know, whether it's in a building or in the city, um, very much like CCTV. It just needs to be there um, in, the, in the background and it will connect with people's devices. Not everybody, because not everybody's going to want to connect with it, but people that want to, so the community of 11 million deaf people, 2 million people with sight loss and 1.3 million people with, uh, in wheelchairs, they can all make use of this feature and facility. The more feedback you provide into the program um, by saying that you went to a venue, be it a hospital, the doctors, uh, transport, what was your experience like on a, on, a, on, a, on a rail network? That can help others to identify which rail networks are good, which venues are great to use um, from, a, from a point of view of accessibility. Are there ramps? Um, are there screen readers? How can I read the menu at the restaurant, etc.? Here's just an exa a few examples. Um, so a few years ago, a couple of girls were killed on a railway crossing. They were both deaf, unfortunately. Uh, sorry, not unfortunately that they were deaf, but they were unfortunately killed. Um, but you can get a text message like this. And these text messages are offline, so no connectivity required. You're using Bluetooth, low energy, so you don't have to worry about people not having connection. Often people are standing on a train platform, uh, and there are delays. Um, to, your, to, your, to, your, to your transport. He people with hearing loss don't hear these. They miss their trains. They miss their platforms. They miss these this changes. I went recently to a rail network operator, the, one of the largest stations in the country, and the attitude was, well, we've got um, digital signage up for people that are, um, have got hearing loss, and we've got audio announcements for visually impaired. But the digital signage and the audio announcements don't always match what's actually going on in real life. And they don't have as much time as we do. So it's not really fair. Um, when you're sitting at the doctor's surgery, the doctor calls you. You don't know that the doctor's called you. So there you go. You can have a two-way interaction. Once you've come to the surgery, you can check into the surgery, and then the doctor can start communicating with you. You've arrived. If you've been checked in, if you need to go to uh, x-ray department on the, on the second floor, you can get this two-way communication and be directed straight to the, to, to the, next, um, to the relevant department. Now coming to the smart, smart home. These are, these are accessories that are really marketed to the masses as novelties. Google Home, Alexa, Apple Home, Hive, Ring, Nest. Great to have. You know, Hive is a, a, pro a project that's been driven by Centrica, um, who are British Gas. They're bragging at the moment. That it's, wow, they've got 500,000 users. We've got a population of 60 million plus. <laughs> whoopie, whoopie do. But those 500,000, you know, they, do they include people with disabilities? People with disabilities can't change their thermostats. They can't read their meters. They can't, they, they can't get around their homes as easily as we can. So there's a huge market that can be tapped into. Um, Ring is a video doorbell entry system for people that, are, uh, that have got hearing loss, really. So people with hearing loss don't always hear their doorbell. If you've got a cat or a dog, they might charge at the door and um, 
alerts you to somebody at the door, but Ring is actually a really cool feature because you can answer your doorbell from anywhere in the world so, and just let the person know that you are occupied at present, so please leave the parcel or um, I'm not available to come to the door right now, and you will be able to see who that person is. It records movement, etc., etc. So from a security point of view as well, you're getting um, a, a good feat around what's going on, on at your house when you're not there. When it comes to something like Alexa, thanks very much, Hector. You've uh, promoted that for me tonight. But uh, a few examples of what Alexa can do for people that are visually impaired or deaf or hard of hearing. Because a person who's deaf or hard of hearing can't even hear his kettle boiling. Maybe he didn't fill it up properly, and maybe there's no water in it. We don't know. So that could lead to a fire. So we ask Alexa, turn the kettle on. Alexa, order some dog food. Alexa, play me some music. Really simple, contactless ways of communicating. Using a wearable, you can call somebody in another room. Alexa, call so-and-so to, to come for dinner. A text message can be sent to their wearable device. So it's really, uh, you know, these products and services are available, but do people know, know about it? A few simple things to consider, really, as I've mentioned, is a boiling kettle, a doorbell, talking to a family member in another room, smoke alarm, your lighting, for a visually impaired person, walking from room to room is quite um, in, 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 a, in a strange place. Obviously, they're quite familiar with their home environment. But if you go to a strange environment, a hotel, for instance, it's good to have different lighting in different rooms because although they're visually impaired, they most or 95% of visually impaired people have some degree of, of, of light um, sensor. At work, in public spaces, so you've got announcements uh, being made all the time in retail environments, in your work, evacuations, fire alarm, navigation, and, and when you think about those in the health and safety, these are required must-haves. So the key thing here, really, to, to the takeaway is building awareness, okay? Nobody needs any of these gadgets, nobody needs any of these nice things, they're all nice to have, but if they're there, and they are, make people aware that they're there. What is it, what can it do, and what is actually available? The purple pound is worth over 200 billion pounds per annum to the UK economy. Just think, that is a huge market that marketeers and brands can actually tap into. Visually impaired people, two million people, can't see adver adverts, they can't see them. So what's the point, you know? Um, but you can communicate those adverts to somebody in proximity to that advert based on their online, their online search. If, they've been, if you've been searching for a holiday and um, you're not quite sure or you haven't committed yet, so you've put it in your basket, you walk around town, there's an out-of-home advert with a beacon attached to it that can connect via the algorithms and say, well, okay, Frank, You've been looking at this advert because you've seen our, uh, looking at a holiday, because you've seen our advert in this proximity today, we'll offer you 20% if you close your basket. Job done. It's a way that they can uh, reach their customer. A quote I'd like to leave you with, because um, the question often comes up in very, uh, Molly from Molly Watt um, has had a number of questions have asked uh, around design processes. When should accessibility build, be built into design? So I picked this up at an exhibition recently. Focus on the user and all else will follow. Because most of the accessibility features that we're working on are actually relevant to people that don't need them. Um, and if they're there, they're nice to have. So why not? In closing, my mission state is, statement is don't wait for opportunity. Create it. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas. <laughs>
as a hearing individual, when I walk through a shopping mall, I don't have the choice of switching off announcements that don't interest me. I have to hear them, regardless. So for somebody who is not, who cannot hear, but wants to hear, they've got the choice. It's giving people a choice. So I don't see it as a problem because it's not going to affect anybody else that doesn't have it. So I'm particularly interested in how accessibility and assisted digital often, where they overlap. Um, and you mentioned earlier about kind of the split in demographics and how millennials do this and Generation Y do this and how baby boomers, actually if you look at the, the kind of tail off from an assisted digital perspective, baby boomers and upwards, so let's say my grandma who's 87, mm -hmm. um, she has a phone, has always had, like, has had a phone for the last 10 years. She definitely doesn't have a smartphone and wouldn't know what Bluetooth was. But I would hypothesize that the 11 million hard of hearing users that you refer to, quite a large number of them will be in this much older demographic. How do you think we make sure that we don't overlook assisted digital when we're also finding solutions to accessibility? So if we go back to the, um, the original, my starting point is everybody's different. There's no one size fits all. We can't accommodate everybody's wish and needs. We can only provide something for people to use. So how did you say your mum was? So my grandma's 87. Your grandma's 87. So my mother's 84. And she grew up in a, in a world where there was no tech, right? Um, so she's never used a computer and she's retired and so forth. And recently I sent, I, pack, I, I went out and purchased a tablet and a phone and I set everything up for her on this side in the UK and packaged it up and sent it across to South Africa uh, where she lives at the moment. Now, bearing in mind she's never used a computer so she doesn't even know what these things do. I was able to talk to her over the phone and tell her where to go, what presents to do, what, what buttons to press. The biggest barrier was getting over the icons because a microphone to her looked like an egg in a cup. But, um, you know, I'm saying, touch the microphone, and she's going, where's the microphone? There's no microphone. I'm going, it is. It looks like an egg in a cup. So that's one of the barriers you have to get over. <laughs> the demographic population of baby boomers and older, with all due respect, um, you know, we're all moving forward and we're all moving on. And the, the size of that population at the moment is probably the larger portion of my hearing loss community. But moving forward, the statistics show that by 2035, the current figures are going to grow by 40%. So whilst we've got an, a group of people that are not particularly interested in it, could play around with it, once they've moved on, we've got a generation coming up behind us and behind them who need to have something in place for when these things happen. Does that answer your question? So when it comes to Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, 5G, we didn't know about this. I didn't read a manual about Bluetooth. <laughs> yes, Hector. Sorry. I'm um, sorry. So, I'd Paul, like to follow Paul. on from what you're saying. Um, I think actually one of the bigger issues is, you know, there's the generation who don't know what tech can do to help them. Uh, but then there's the generation of professionals and therapists and occupational therapists who are not even being trained on the assistive technology and the power that it can, it, it can, it can deliver. Um, <clears throat> when I was talking about Alexa earlier, uh, my wife's an occupational therapist, uh, and she's the one that hates the assistive technology, which kind of always worries me. Uh, but, but, but it's actually, until we can raise the profile of the needs of people with disabilities and what assistive technology is doing, to get it into the curriculum of the therapists who will bridge the generation gap, you know, be the helping professional, I think we have a problem. Sure, on that note, um you, you, you emphasize that your wife doesn't um, like Alexa. Does she understand how to use it? And I assume she does because of the rest of the family. I actually think it's because when she shouts Hector, it's, uh, it reacts. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, so it, it, I've got a smartphone, but I don't particularly want to use it. I want to use an normal phone. That's much, it's choice at the end of the day. Um, Paul. Yeah, hi, Frank. Um, yep, this is on. Um, great. I, I think just really a statement and linking sort of Hector's talk and, and, and yourself, Frank. I think the point about having specialist apps where folks with access needs can put in those access needs, 
and these beacons are having more sensors around us as we're all living longer and as our senses go. I think the sensors will help provide that, that kind of personalized tailored service. I think there's a great resource um, called the Global Public uh, Inclusive Infrastructure, or GPII.net. And really that's the long-term view of what we're really talking about here. So this view that you can have what Hector's talking about in terms of AI, but if you're always pinching to Zoom, why can't your computer spot that and adjust that you want things big? And how we can carry or port those personal preferences with us. So if I'm on a, a library PC, if I go to a train station, if I go to a cash machine, that those devices kind of flex to our needs and our, our kind of capabilities, which I'm really excited about. Um, I think the point about APIs as well, with more um, companies, so you know, I, I lead accessibility for Barclays, and we've experimented with beacons before. Um, we're very keen that we record access needs of our customers so we can give them a tailored service, but we're also keen that customers, if they tell us once, now, maybe they're deaf and they don't want us to make outbound telephone calls to them. Or maybe they want their paperwork in large prints. So sort of how can they also take that information with them and make it easier to pass on to, to other service providers? So I, I think there's an interesting point about that sharing and porting of your personal preferences as someone with an access need to sort of tell, you know, tell people fewer times. But, so I think that's going to be an interesting one in the future. It is, uh, and if I can help uh, just quickly build on that, Paul, um, uh, there's a number of businesses and companies and advertisers and brands that have tried be beacons. Um, now, I'm not going to dismiss the fact uh, of what they've done, but until now, most of it's been in a very siloed operation. So if Barclays have done something, they've done something specifically to them and what they want. They haven't gone out to the wider community. Coming to your point earlier um, um, is um, the reach. Right? So Magnum did a beacon campaign whereby people walked into the co-op and if they, had the, if they had the relevant app and they had Bluetooth switched on, they would get a free Magnum promotion. So the, the, the problem with that is that you can't all work in silos, which is why I've kind of identified this need to cover all bases. And the, the, the common denominator amongst all of us is the smartphone. And so I've got a beacon that uses a URL, it can broadcast a URL. So in your back end, if you've got all the algorithms and the AI and the cognitive set up, when somebody reach, uh, receives a URL beacon notification, that URL is going to open on their phone based on that person's personal preferences. Somebody mentioned earlier about privacy um, in Hector's talk. The, the issue with privacy there is the fact that once you've, had, once you've got a smartphone and you've signed up for a smartphone, you've given up your right to privacy at the end of the day. You know, Google and Apple know exactly where you are all times of the day, regardless of how you try and hide. And everybody else that's got an app with, with uh, um, location settings on, they can all find these things out because very few of us turn off location settings. I'm speaking very generally over here, but those that know, turn it off. Those that don't know, haven't got a clue, and it doesn't worry them anyway. Can I, can I give an example that builds on the coffee shop that you yes, were talking please. about? So please. Um, I'm autistic, and I often can't speak. Um, in fact, this is my first event in about three years, which is terrifying. Congratulations. Um, well done. But, uh, oh. <laughs> please don't clap. I'd make it worse. <laughs> um, and I, my, I basically don't have a sense of temperature. And okay. um, I actually use my watch to order the coffee. So the coffee shop have never heard me speak. And when I go in, I have a little thing on my watch. Um, it's called Proloquo for text, and it shows what I'd like to order. And I went in one time with a nasty cold, and I had a lem sip. And I said, can you make this for me? And um, so it's quite interesting The watch ordering is quite useful, because I can just communicate with them that way. Um, but anyway, I went in with this lem sip, and they made it for me. And um, I took a sip of it, and I immediately burnt myself. Um, I don't have a great sense of temperature. And what had happened is that there was some information in the environment of the temperature of the thing will be hot that I missed out on. So originally I said to myself, oh, Jamie, you moron. You know, remember, hot things are hot. You need to learn this. You're an idiot. Da, 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 da. And then I stopped and went, wait, no. The environment was missing something. So I just set up a geofence on my phone. And every time I go into the cafe, it pops up a little reminder going, Jamie, hot things are hot. So it was just having the environment give me information. 
And that, that's kind of like a trend in assistive technology, making the environment give more information. So I hope that's a useful example. Thank you very much. And that's very helpful, uh, Jamie. But um, to be honest with you, it's really down to the coffee shop. They have a legal obligation to make you aware of the fact that your drink is going to be hot. Um, when, I go, when I go to Costa Coffee and I order a tea, they uh, automatically want to give me two cups because they are obliged to give me two cups from a health and safety point of view that I may burn my hands. And you know, I don't like two cups, so I tell, tend to tell them don't like it. So it's not, your, it's not down to you, Jamie, but good on you for coming up with that idea. It's something to bear in mind for the developers that when you, they can geofence an awful lot of um, uh, options. On that note, I just want to come back to Paul's uh, comment earlier, because you mentioned about an app. There's an app for everything, pretty much. But as a visually impaired person, you can't afford to have 100 million apps on your phone because you really, it's, it's hard enough to navigate one or two apps that your, are your favorite, most common apps. So what, what you need really is a one, a one sort of ubiquitous product that's gonna service a specific requirement. Anybody else, friends and family, or somebody else at, at work who might find benefit in using that, welcome to use it. But you know, having one app that can cover payments, people, that are, people with hearing loss that are deaf, they're nervous to pay because they didn't know, didn't hear what, what, what the amount was. Visually impaired people often you know, bring out the wrong note. Ten pound notes now have three dots on it. Not everybody knows it. I've come across some visually impaired people that don't know about that. But it's, you know, it's, it's daunting. Try and go out there. Uh, I think Gavin from a neat box can, uh, will agree with me that unless you've lived or spent a day in the life of somebody who is visually impaired or hearing, with hearing loss, you really haven't experienced what they go through because they can't see what's in their way. Um, so, you know, simple things in life that we take for granted. I'm particularly interested in the IFTTT, which you mentioned, but you didn't kind of go further on. On the? On the IFTTT, or if oh, you yes. that. I, yeah. I actually think that offers huge potential. Huge. Uh, because, you know, all of the, you know, all of the services are feeding into it. Uh, and if we looked at the kind of the protocol to go or the protocol to text example there, there's probably an IFTTT variant that you can 100%. That you can 100%. To do that. What would be nice is to have maybe an accessibility meetup where we hacked on IFTTT concepts and put a load of ideas together. That might be quite Does anybody know or does anybody not quite understand what IFTT is? So IFTT is if this, then that. So if I walk into the room, switch the lights on for me. If, if there's nobody at home, turn on the alarm. Technology can do this for you. Uh, if I walk into Costa Coffee, remind me that I don't want about the hot drink. So it's that, uh, that's a, those are things. But you need triggers. So if you think about Pokemon Go game, fantastic little game that everybody had. But beacons can act as little Pokemon Go, so that when I walk around Barclays over here, I can be told, oh, there's drinks and snacks here. Oh, this is where the toilets are. Oh, you're in reception. Oh, this is the exit. If the technology is there. Nobody needs it. It's nice to have. I, I, I would definitely put IFTTT on your phones, though, and, and play around with it, because it's actually interesting to link There's Spotify. some great giveaways. Go link Spotify into Office 365, into Google Maps, into uh, the weather forecast. You will start to think of really cool ones that you can design, or other people have come up with the idea for. So it's, it's definitely one of those takeaways to play with, if you've never heard of it. If you go to the IFTT website, um, they've got some fast, fantastic, they've got a great app and some fantastic giveaways at the moment for Christmas. Awesome. Brilliant. Okay. Um, thank you so, so much. Can you put your hands together? Thank you, Frank. That was fascinating.